We want to say greetings to everyone and God bless you. And thank you all for uh, joining us and uh, for uh, allowing us to share the word of God with you all and also to share um, in song and also in prayer. We pray that as uh, we continue to uh, move forward in the things of God that we all will continue to grow also in the things of God. Amen. I pray that everyone is ready to hear the word of the Lord today. It seemed like uh, we've been having some issues with <laughs> some of the technical stuff, but uh, I think we got it good and running now. So we just thank God, of course, for this opportunity to to uh, come before you. Uh, I thought that I was going to get to preach a little bit more on what we've been preaching about lately. Uh, but apparently that's not God's will for tonight. Tonight, So we're going to uh, speak on these things that God would have us to say uh, concerning his, his word. And I pray that as we uh, move forward in the things of God, as he uh, speaks to us, that we will have a listening ear to receive what it is that he has to say. Uh, one thing that I know so far in his ministry is that whenever God says something, it's for a reason, that he's not just talking you know, and sometimes I think, uh, especially we're used to going uh, to different places or used to being somewhere, and we can just kind of tune things out, you know, and and uh, we get used to that. But God wants us to give a listening ear to what it is that he has to say to us because it's for us, you see, it's for us. And uh, if we will take heed and not think, Oh, brother so-and-so should have really been here. Or sister so-and-so should have really been here. Uh, if, if we will listen at what God is saying to us in his word, he'll speak to us in his word. Uh, you know, you could say something and have all of the people in the audience, they'll all take it a different way. You see, it, God will be speaking something different to, to this person than he is that person, you see. and, and But it's, it's the same scripture, it's the same word, it's just... Situations are different for everybody. And so God wants us to take heed to these things that he He teaches us, that he teaches us. And so uh, the Lord kind of gave me a crash course, I guess you could say, on what was going to be spoken tonight. So we'll just go ahead and get right into uh, get right into his words. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to the third chapter of the book of Genesis. And... Uh, <clears throat> My wife have told me uh, that I preach from that chapter a lot, you know, and I imagine so. Uh, the book of Genesis, that, that word means beginning, beginning of life. And just about every um, theme that you find in the Bible, you can find it in the book of Genesis. Other places may deal with it as well. But God preached the whole Bible in the book of Genesis, if that makes any sense. And so uh, we're going to get into his word. Tonight, uh, if the Lord say the same, we're going to talk to you about location and, and God's sovereign will concerning location. That God is not somebody that just woke up out of bed one day and just said, okay, you know, I just let humanity go wherever they want to go and do what they want to do or whatever the case may be. Everything that God does there's a purpose and there's a reason for it. He's not just bored, some bored child, you know, with with a, a magnifying glass holding it over an ant pile, you see. he's He's got a lot to do, and everything that he does, there's a reason for it. Now, if you will start with that mindset, then when God tell you to do something, you'll be uh, in less of a hurry to backslide from it. And when God tell you to go somewhere, you won't be thinking the other direction. You see, you'll you'll be what He tell you to be, if you know that there is purpose, that God, there's there's something to it. You see, there's something to it. Uh, back in 1993, in January of 1993, uh, I I came to Nashville with a friend of mine. We were both in the Navy together, stationed in Virginia Beach. And uh, it, when I got here, uh, I was sick. I took sick for some reason, so I didn't get to go out as much as I would like. And, you know, I got to meet some of his family and things like that. But I didn't get to 
go out like I wanted to see the city, you see. And, you know, uh, at that time, Nashville was voted the most friendliest city in America, you see. And, and I can remember uh, thinking from that point to just a couple of years ago, a few years ago, if I ever had my choice of where I'd live, it would be in Nashville, you see. And I've lived in several places since then, in California, and since then really have been all over the world. But I, I never forgot Nashville, you see. And so, but my thing was, if I ever get to choose where I want to live, you see, because I've never had a choice, not since I've been saved, you know, it, it's, you know, un, without getting outside of God's will. Now, if I'm going to be in God's will, I don't have a choice. I have to do what he say do, and I have to be where he tells me to be, you see. And so that was my thing. As I, if I ever got a choice, I'd live there. Now, little did I know uh, that, that that would take place, that, you know, it would be God's will. I didn't know that it would be God's will, but God knew it. And uh, in uh, 2005, of course, that friend, now he's back here uh, in his hometown, retired from the military. And in 2005, he, well, in the 1990s, I think it was 98, uh, he got sick. Um, they thought that he, he thought he had just had the flu. But he ended up having what they call spinal encephalitis. And by the time they caught it, he was in a coma, and he was fully deaf and blind when he come out of the coma, you see. And because they had let it, he had let it go for so long, he just thought that he had the, the flu or a cold or something. And so now he can see a little bit and he can hear a little bit, but he's still legally deaf and blind. And so that was in 1998. And all of these years, you know, because when we, we left Virginia, Actually, I left Virginia in 1993 in March, going around the world, and he stayed there. You know, he was stationed there, continued to be there. And so over all of the, over these many years, I kept in touch with him. I would call him and write him and things like that. And so one day, I finally uh, I got in touch with him, and uh, I actually with his command here because he was recruiting. And one of the uh, his his the people that he was stationed here with told me what had happened to him. And so uh, fast forward to 2005, I was pastoring a church in my hometown in Louisiana, and I had a, a dream that, uh, it, that I was going to this lake, and in this lake were the people that I was pastoring at the time. And they were standing in, I guess, about a foot deep of water. Uh, they were praying, they were singing, they were preaching, doing things that church people do, and uh I, when I, I got in the water and I tried to call them out to the deep part of it, I kept telling them, come on, y'all, let's go out to the deep. And uh, they said, no, no, we can't go out there. We'll drown if we go out there. I said, no, let's go. The Lord's not going to let you drown. Let's go. And uh, they just refused. They were satisfied in that shallow water. And so then the Lord spoke to me and said, you're going to have to go. And so I left, went on out there in the deep and just was out there just enjoying the presence of the Lord. And I felt sorry for them because they had no idea what it was like, you see. They were just, they were in the waters, the safety water. You know, you don't drown in foot deep of water unless you're sleeping in it some kind of way. But they were safe. And that's where a lot of church folks are today, safe, without faith. You see, without faith. And that was the problem. And that was the Lord showing me that I was going to resign from that church because I took them as far as they were willing to go. They were satisfied with that shallow worship. Let's pray, let's preach, let's sing and go home. Nobody get healed because I'm not willing to step out on faith in my own life. So how am I going to pray for somebody to get them healed? You see that? If you can't believe God that one plus one is two, you're not going to believe him when it's time for calculus or anything like that either. You see, so that that was the problem there. And so when I got out to that deep there, I was swimming and backstroking and just enjoying. And, you know, if you if you have ever been in very, very deep water, especially very deep water, the deeper the water is, the more your body is going to float. Now, if you are in four or five feet deep water, you have to swim and, and wrestle with that water to keep your body afloat. But when you go out in 20-foot deep water or 30-feet deep water, 
the, the less it takes for you to float. You see? Dead people float. You see? Dead people float. As long as you fight in that water, <laughs> you're not going to float. You'll just sink right to the bottom. But if you notice, that when you go out into that deep, most of us have been in a swimming pool with about 12 feet deep of water. If you've ever done like I've done and you jump in that 12 feet deep part of it and you go to the bottom, you have to literally struggle to keep yourself at the bottom. If your feet, if your feet, if you want to keep your feet on the floor, uh, you have to struggle to do that because naturally so your body will just rise up to the top. And so people have to swim to the bottom. You see, and then keep themselves there. You know, you, you, it's, and so the deeper the water is, the less of a struggle you have to keep yourself afloat. So when I was in the military, we learned that that you know, if you don't fight the water, it'll keep you on top of it. You see, you, you'll st you'll stay on top of it. That's the reason why dead people uh, float when when they deceased because they're no longer fighting that water, and eventually their body will just pick on up. You see. And so they were satisfied with that, that shallow water. And, and many people, Christians today, are satisfied with that. You know, they're satisfied with, I see it if, when I, I, I believe it when I see it. Uh, they're satisfied with, let's go to church. Let's not ever break routine. Let's just do our same routine that we always do so that, you know, and put God on the program so we'll know what's going to happen next. So we'll know what time we're going to get out of church so we can watch football. When football season started, we can watch basketball. Let's keep God on a schedule. Let's not go outside of those boundaries, you know, because it's scary out there. Let's stay right here where if we fall, we can just stand up and not worry about drowning. You see, that's what people are. And so <clears throat> when I got out there in the deep, I was swimming and, you know, just floating, really. And so it went from there. So I was sitting in the living room of, of, of my friend, the one that I'm talking about, on his uh, sofa next to him. And I told him, put your hand in my hand. And when he put his hand in my hand, he began to yell, I can see, I can hear. And, and that was the Lord showing me what was going to take place. Now, this is 2005, and uh, I had no idea at the time, because you keep in mind I was pastoring this other church. I had no idea at the time that I would be living here. But God knew it. Had no idea that I would resign from the church, but God knew it. You see? And, and so many things have happened between then and now that it would take me the rest of the night to explain them to you. But let me just say this, just to sum it up. When God wants you somewhere, don't you make him push you there. You see, when God wants you somewhere, you better be there because he has a way of making you get there. And you can go willfully <laughs> with a smile on your face. Or you can go w with a frown on your face. Either way, you'll get there, especially if God has something for you to do. You see, location is, 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 is key. It's is what it's about. And, and if you're not careful, you see, You'll get yourself in trouble. What are we talking about? After you get to where God wants you to be, God doesn't want you crying and boohooing about where he has you. It does you no good to be somewhere physically where God's will is for you and, and then for you to backslide in your heart and your mind. That in itself will keep you. you you'll just be there in God's place where he has you but it won't do you any good. You won't move forward. You see? You see? As long as you're looking back at Egypt like the children of Israel were, you'll, you'll be right there looking into the promised land and still not, in, not able to inherit it. you just, you know, and you'll be wishing that you had just kept your mouth shut about it. Don't ever, when God says something, don't ever talk against it. Don't ever say, I wish I was or I remember when and all of this. God doesn't, you know, God doesn't take kindly to that. That's, that's a slap in his face that he, from the beginning of time, uh, fixed it where you would be, what your location would be before you were born, before Adam was created. He's the one that set all of these things in motion, you see. 
And, and then you get way down here and, and 40 and 50 years old and think you know better. When that one has always existed. You see? And so when he says, this is where I want you to be, it wasn't just because he woke up one morning and thought it was a good idea. It was always that way. Always. You see, now, it might just come to us when we turn 30 or when we turn 40 and we get enough sense to try to follow him. But it was always that way. And so we're going to explain that this morning more in detail. Uh, the third chapter of the book of Genesis. And we're going to start reading at verse 20. It says, And Adam calls his wife name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Now, it's funny, you know, you, you read these scriptures. Uh, you, I've heard some preachers say that there were some other folks that lived before Adam and Eve, that there were some other people in this world, and, and God destroyed it all and stuff like that, you know, before Adam and Eve were created, but that's not so. I've heard some people say, you know, people have asked me the question, well, who did, did, uh, did the sons of Adam and Eve marry? Because, you know, of course, in our minds, it would be wrong for them to marry their own sisters. But it had to be them because this word tells us that Eve was the mother of all living. You see, she was the mother of all living. You see that. All right. Verse 21. And Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make coats unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord make coats of skin and clothed them. Now, that's a picture, of course, <coughs> of God's uh, uh, grace. And, you know, because if you remember uh, earlier on in this chapter, when they realized that they were naked, they sold fig leaves together. Now, it never was meant for us to walk around with clothes on. You see, that, that wasn't God's perfect will. You see, his perfect will was for us to be clothed in his grace. That was his perfect will. And people could look at one another and not lust. But when sin came into the world uh, and we all of a sudden knew good and evil, uh, we went and sold folk fig leaves together. Of course, those fig leaves represent religion. Ever since then, man have been trying to put fig leaves together to try to reach God and to cover themselves. The word religion means to cover. You see, and ever since then, men have been trying to cover themselves. And so God, look at what this says there. That he made coats of skin. What does that mean? Well, for him to get coats of skin, he had to kill an animal. And from that point, somebody had to die for sin. For your covering, in other words. Somebody had to die. You see, something had to, blood had to be shed, in other words. And that's what that represents. Now, let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 22, and the Lord God said, but behold, the man has become as one of us. To know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Everybody understand? And so when God created uh, mankind, he put them in that garden. That was God's location for them. And when they got out of God's will and they disobeyed God, God pushed them out of that location because, of course, according to the word of God, the tree of life was there. He had already spoke death on them, on them and told them what would take place. And so to keep his word, he said, well, let's, we're going to have to push them out of the garden. And so let me make this clear. Every sense God pushed mankind out of his first location. It has been our job as humanity to find that location again. God's perfect will for Adam and Eve was the Garden of Eden. That was a natural, real garden. Now, spiritually speaking, since we've gotten pushed out of that garden, now we have to find our Eden. In other words, God's perfect will for you. The location for you. Does everybody understand? And so ever since then, you see, we have been doing that. 
if we have any sense. I'm talking about spiritual sense. We can't just uh, say, well, you know, this is where I was born and, and, and this is just where I want to make my home or whatever the case is. You, you can't use that because it, you can. We, we started at the beginning to show you that we were knocked off track way back then. And so every believer, when they get saved, their mindset should be, Lord, where do you want me? Why? Because maybe mom and daddy were not saved. And even if they were, just because it's your will for them to be here doesn't mean that it's your will for me to be here. You see, let's let's go now to the 11th chapter of the book of Genesis. We're going to stay in Genesis for the most part tonight. The 11th chapter of the book of Genesis, and we're going to start reading at verse 27. It says, Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. And Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his nativity in Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took them wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarah was barren. She had no child. And Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of, of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. In chapter 12, verse 1, it reads, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And so God tells Abram, get out of your father's house. You see that? And from around your kindred, in, in, in other words, leave everything that you know. And, and let, let's read that. Unto a land that what? I will show you. Let's go real quick to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews. Hold your spot there. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. And the uh, start reading at the eighth verse. It says, "By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whether he went." Everybody understand that? By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. The heirs with him of the same promise, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now, what is what is the writer of the book of Hebrews saying? This writer here is clarifying for us that when Abraham left, he didn't know where he was going. His first order of business was to do what God said: get out of your father's house and from around your country and out of this from around your kindred. And out of this country. And according to the word what we just read. He left. Before God gave him a GPS and told him. This is where you're going and this is how you get there. He left. Now what does that tell us today? That he left not knowing the circumstances. You see. God didn't tell him I want you to go to Canaan. And, and so he get on the internet and see. Yeah Canaan they got some good jobs. Uh. The economy is good. The school is good. My kids can go when we do have children. They can go. You know, they got some good schools. And no, he just left not knowing where he was going. So he didn't know what situation he was going to be in. In other words, he had to trust God and just leave. And oftentimes when we're walking by faith, that's what God will do us. He may tell us where to go, but we don't know the circumstances. And sometimes we don't have any idea what we're getting ourselves into. But let me make this clear. 
when God tell you to go somewhere, it is it, it's good. He's not telling you to go somewhere to destroy you. Uh, I was living in Tulsa uh, several years ago, and the Lord spoke to me and told me to go on down to Louisiana and, and pastor this church. And so it was just a few months of us being there when Hurricane Rita came through there. And uh, uh, it, it was pretty bad. It was, it was pretty bad, you see, when Hurricane Rita came through. I mean, it came directly uh, through there, you see. And so there we were watching it on the news. The hurricane just headed straight there. And, uh, of course, we could feel it. I mean, it sounded like a train. I don't know how to explain it, but it just sounded like a train was just coming through, you know. And uh, uh, I had people, some of the members of the church I was pastoring at that time, knocking on my door because I was living in a trailer. And they were saying, uh, Pastor, you, you, you get out. Now, the news have, have spoken, you know, the anchors have said that if you're in a trailer, you're not going to survive. You need to get out of there. I said, no, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, now, the Lord didn't move me down here to kill me. So I just stay put. Now, if God tells me to go, I'll go. But I'm staying right here, you see. And, and that's exactly what I did. I just stayed right there. Of course, we felt the wind and, and things like that. And, and folks in church running, just, you know, uh, trying to get to another area of Louisiana or Texas and and. and out there, and I found out that some of them got out there and, and ran out of gas and was just stuck on the road, you know, out in the middle of nowhere. I see. But they in church, praise God, we got faith. Listen, when it's your time to go, it's your time to go. You see. When I lived in Tulsa, of course, they were all kind of tornadoes. I used to stand right there on my porch and just watch tornadoes just pass down my street. It was nothing to me because I just understand that, you know, God is in charge. He's in charge, you see. And so I've never been scared of storms or anything like that. But, you know, all of these members, these same folks that are standing in this shallow water, praising the Lord, running. Now, let me make this clear. The Bible says that when we have perfect love, there's no room for fear. And so my point of this story is, is that I just could not fathom in my mind why God. And let me make this. Let me tell you how it happened. Uh, before I moved from Tulsa to my hometown, uh, when the Lord has spoken, told me to um, to move there to pastor that church after they had asked me to be their pastor. Um, I was looking for a place to live. You see, just looking for a place to live and. And uh, one day I finally got in touch because it was hard for me to find a place uh, not being there, you see. And so one day I got in touch with this lady, and I had so much money in the bank. And so I got in touch with this lady, and she had a, a, a trailer that she wanted to rent. And I thought, you know, and she told me, you know, yeah, you could, you could, you could rent it. Uh, and I was just thinking, well, I just trust the Lord that it's in good shape and things like that. And, you know, I'll send you the money tomorrow if you'll hold it for me. She said, yeah, I'll send it. I'll, send, I'll hold it for you if you'll send it. And the Lord must have knew that I was going to really do that because that night I had a dream that I had walked into this trailer. And when I stepped inside, the lady was there to show me around. And when I stepped inside, all of the walls, you know how it's got the different walls separating the different rooms and things like that. All of these walls, I saw them all go down into the floor where the trailer was just one big solid room no walls in it you know except for the outer walls and then I saw these walls come back up but in different places in other words I was standing in a different trailer and after that took place the Lord spoke and said I have a place for you and so what happened that following day that next day the deacon of the church that I pastored he called me and he said uh Brother John, he said, the Lord laid it on my heart, said, I got a trailer on a piece of property that I own, and you're more than welcome to it, you see. And so is the Lord's will. And so it's this trailer that I'm in. And I did, that's why I just couldn't fathom in my mind the Lord knocking that thing down on me if he's the one that said I was going to live there. 
So it, it don't mean when, when the Lord call you to a place, you don't have anything to worry about. When God call you to a place, that's where safety is. That's where safety is. I'm telling you, that's one of the benefits of being in God's will. You know who your protector is. You're not worried about storms. You're not worried about how ends are going to be met or anything. You just know I'm in God's will and he's obligated to take care of the rest. Amen. Now, you have to stand on that. You, what I'm telling you, if you got faith enough to go where God tells you to go, God has enough power to keep you when you get there. Amen. You have to know that. You have to know it. All right. So uh, now. Uh, verse. Uh, let me see. All right. We'll st keep reading at verse four. And we're back in the uh, 12th chapter of the book of Genesis now. And we'll start reading at verse four. <clears throat> It says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sacum unto the plain of Morah, and the Canaanites was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land, and there build it he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Everybody see that? And so in that previous verse of what we just read, according to the word of what we just read, there were people living in that land. The Canaanites were there. And there it is, Abram, he comes there and God says, I'm going to give you this land. Well, wait a minute. How are you going to give me this land and this people are already there? That's like God taking you to a house and saying, you know, that's your house right there. But it's got folks living in that house. You see how much faith? Now, now we better have enough faith to, to, to grasp a hold of a house that's empty. That's alone somebody already living there. Well, what's going to happen between now and then, you know? <laughs> you see? You see why God can't tell us some of the things he want to tell us ahead of time? Because we'd be doubting him all the way. If God showed us a year ago where we're going to be today, Lord, how is that going to happen? You see? So to just to keep us from blaspheming and talking against God's will, he just wait till we, we get there. You know, wait till things are lined up a lot of times, you know. And but Abram had enough faith to say to know, okay, there yeah, there are people in that land. But if God said it's mine, it's mine. Now let me let, let's go ahead and keep reading. We're going to point out some things about Abram's life here. Verse Verse 8, And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west. And hay on the east, and there he built an altar unto the Lord, and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. And there was a famine in the land, and Abram went down into Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was grievous in the land. Oh, wait a minute. What happened? God said, I'm going to give you Canaan. But what did he do? When famine came, in other words, a little bit of hard time, he left. I want to go where there's some food and water. Let's, let's go ahead and keep reading. And it came to pass when he was come near unto, to enter into Egypt that he said unto Sarah, his wife, Behold now, I know that thou art a fair woman to look upon. Therefore it shall come to pass when the Egyptians shall, shall see thee, that they shall say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, thou art my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. You see what happens when you get out of God's will? You got to start making your own way. Now you got all of these other circumstances that come up. Everybody see that? He wouldn't have had that problem of worrying about how fine his wife was and how some thugs in Egypt were going to kill him for his wife if he had just stayed in Canaan. 
But Noah's, I done hit a little hard time. And this can't be God's will. So I'm going to move. I'm going to go to Egypt. You see that? And so when he get to Egypt, he got to start two-stepping. He got to start thinking about all of these things that could happen. Why? Because deep down inside, he knows that he's out of God's will. And when you know that you're out of God's will, now you got to figure out things of your, on your own. You see, it wasn't God's will that he be in Egypt. He wasn't worried about how, how fine his wife was when he was in Canaan and who was going to do what to him because of that. You see that? And that's what happens with us a lot of times. We, we get to that place where God wants us to be. And, you know, and we think for some reason that it's just going to be cloud nine and the devil just going to lay down and not give us any trouble whatsoever. You see. And then when the devil show up to give us a little trouble, all of a sudden I'm out of God's will. Something is wrong here. So let me go somewhere else. But on my way there, let me try to, you know, shuck and jive some kind of way to see, you know, if just in case this happens, we'll have this plan. And that's what happens to Abram. He gets to Egypt and he's worried about folks killing him because of how good his wife looks. Amen. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Uh, verse 14. And it came to pass that when Abram was come into Egypt, the Egyptians beheld the woman that she was very fair. Now, I want you. She, she had to be a good looking woman. To be 65 and, and folks willing to kill Abram over her or for him to even think that she was 65. You know, <laughs> let me leave that alone. <laughs> so verse 15 says, the princess also of Pharaoh saw her and commended her before Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house and he entreated Abraham well for her sake. And he had sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. Everybody see that? And so Abraham is being treated well. Because this Pharaoh or the king of Egypt want to marry, want to be with his wife. Now, he didn't know, of course, that that was his wife. And so this man is basically courting Sarah for the purpose of marrying her and trying to get in good with Abram by giving him all kind of natural possessions. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 17. And the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that thou hast done unto me? Why didst thou not tell me that she was thy wife? Why saidst thou she is my sister, so I might have taken her to me to wife? Now therefore, behold thy wife, take her and go thy way. Now, if you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we read in chapter 20, the same thing happening. They were in another land, and he did the same thing. Again, outside of God's will. He was supposed to be in Canaan. And every time he left Canaan, he had to come up with some schemes and plots and plans to, 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 you know, to live. And when you're outside of God's will, and when you're not in a place where God have called you to be, especially when God was gracious enough to show you what his will was, it's going to be some, plinks, some uh, scheming going on, some plotting going on. How are we going to make it? How are we going to do this? You see? Yeah, you go, yeah, you're on your own when you're outside of God's will. Because God is not obligated to provide for you outside of his will. The children of Israel, and now let, let's keep this in mind. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, it was God's will that they go into the promised land a couple of weeks later. But it took 40 years. You see, now God understood they, they have to. Go through the, you know, they have to go through the wilderness. And I feed them while they're going through there. they just passing through there. But he told them, you're going to inherit a land that's flowing with milk and honey. The same land that God had promised Abraham. And he tell them, it's, it, the vineyard's already planted. You're not going to have worries when you get there. You're not going to have to build houses. Those folks have already built houses. I'm going to just push them out of the way and you're going to take over. But when they get to the wilderness, trouble come, you know, why? what happened? They were comfortable in Egypt. They had adjusted. And so they still had an Egyptian mentality, an Egypt mentality. And so what happened when they got in the wilderness, 
it was not comfortable. And so, for those first couple of weeks, God fed them manna. And then when they, because of their lack of faith and not believing and trusting God, chose not to go in and inherit the blessing, which was the land and the good thereof, God didn't, and God told them, now you're going to walk around for 40 years uh, until this generation die off. And look at what God did. And I'm going to continue to feed you manna. In other words, I'm not going to bring the blessings and the promises of the land of Canaan to you while you're in the wilderness. If you wanted it, you should have went and got it. And most of us, we get mad at God because we're in the wilderness and we want him to bring it all to us while we're in our unbelief. Listen. If God had overstepped them and their will and had pushed all of those people out and said, OK, see, I've cleared the land. Y'all can go in now. You know what would have happened? They went in there, but they would not have had the faith to stay there. The devil would have kicked up dust after they got in there and moved in and they ran right back out of there. So God was saying, your faith is going to have to mature for you to inherit what I have for you so that you can hold on to it. That devil that, that fights you to keep you from getting to the promised land, after you get there, he's going to fight you to keep it. You better know it. You see that? You better know it. And so, yeah, we, we're, we're, we have an enemy, and he don't sleep. He don't sleep. And so this is what we find with, with, with Abram. All right, verse 20. It says, And Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away, and his wife, and all that he had. And Abram went out uh, up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had, had been in what, at what? The beginning. You see? Now, he went through all of this because he got out of God's will. And, 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 and a lot of times that's what we'll do. When you get outside of God's will, you'll go through much more than what you have to go through. Now, you're going to already go through something being in his will. The good news is you got him there with you to help you, to protect you, to provide for you, all of these things to bless you. But when you get outside of God's will, who's your protector then? You see, when, when you're not walking by faith, you're walking by sight. And so now your mood swings, your good, you know, all of these things are based on what you can see. I have a steady paycheck coming in, so I'm in a good mood. As soon as God shaped that, I don't know what's going to take place. I'm in a bad mood now. That's not faith. And God wants us to walk by faith. If we are going to inherit the promises of God, it's more than going to church, hearing a preacher preach, singing, all of these things. We have to walk by faith. You see? Even this day, God calls people to a particular location. When you get there, you make sure that you have the faith to stay there. You make sure that you don't allow the enemy to cause you to go back in your minds. To, you know, in other words, having a, a, a wilderness mentality. One day we're going to preach on that when the, Lord, uh, when the Lord allows us to preach on it. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, there was one sin that God hated above all the others that they had done. It wasn't making the golden calf, you see. It wasn't them rebelling against Moses and Aaron. One sin he hated above all the others. This sin is what stopped them from going into the land of Canaan a couple of weeks after they came out of Egypt. What was that sin? The Bible called it murmuring. In other words, complaining. So let me make this clear before we close tonight. There's no use in being in God's will if you're going to complain about it. You might as well stay where you are if you're going to complain about the journey. I used this example before and we'll say it again. Uh, of course, my wife, she'll shop. You know, she's one of those people. She can go to the store and, and get lost in there for four or five hours. 
And I, it, it's just something that I cannot, I can't, I don't know what goes on there. I don't know, you know, I just don't get it. <laughs> but I just, sometimes I get so frustrated, you know, and I, I, I can wake up and think, I'm going to be a good husband today. I'm going to go shopping with my wife. I'm going to show her, you know, I love her. <laughs> and then I get to the store and she's just standing there looking, looking, looking. 16 ounces versus 14.1. I'm thinking, <laughs> does it really take all of this? <laughs> and I'll be just standing there thinking, man, I should have just stayed at home. I forgot what it was like shopping with her. <laughs> I'm going to just find other ways to express my love, that's all. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I just don't get it. I understand we want bargains and deals, but is it worth all of this? You see, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so in that, you know, and I, I try to be careful, more careful now, because when we first got married and I'd go shopping with her thinking I'm going to be a good husband, I'm going to show her I can hang, you know, for an hour or two or whatever. And then, you know, before the first hour get here, uh, it's done. I'm tired, you know, because my wife, not me personally, it don't bother me as much as long as we're walking around. Let's walk. You know, just know what you're going to get and just, you know, just knock it off the shelf into the basket as we're passing by. <laughs> you see? My wife, she's going to stand there. She's going to go back and forth, back and forth. 14 ounces, 15 ounces. This one's this many more pennies. And I just... I, I just can't do it, you see. And so she'll just stand there, and I'm just rocking back and forth from one leg to the other, you know, hoping that something happens. Somebody pull the fire alarm or something so we can leave out of here. <laughs> and so when we first got married, I was always complaining. You know, I would go shopping with her, and but I would complain, you know. I would walk around sighing like, <sighs> You know, I would do all of that like, oh, my gosh, can we please? This is torment. I mean, I just I don't get it. You know, when I go to the store, I know what I'm going there for. To me, it's not worth standing there for 10 minutes to try to pick one or the other. Just get what you're going to get, you know. And so uh, I would complain about it. And I found out that no matter how much of a will I had to go with her to the store, you know, and, and in my mind, I think I'm showing her love just by being here. My murmuring killed and canceled me being there. In other words, if I, if I wanted to show her in that manner how much I love her because I hate shopping and I'm willing to go with you, it did, it, it did me no good if I was complaining about it while I was there, you see. And it's the same thing with God. When God gets you to whatever location he wants you to be in, you can be there physically and not there in your mind. You see, the Bible says that the children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt, the Bible says they went back in their minds, which is why they could never go into the promised land. You know, it took them 40 years to get there because it took them 40 years to drop that Egypt mentality. Wish to God we were back in Egypt where the flesh pots are or were. Everybody understand? And so it does you no good to be in God's will and, to, and then to complain about it when you're there. You'll just stay put until you learn to quit murmuring. And so let's, let's keep that in mind as we continue to move forward in, in, in the things of God. That God has you in a particular place for a reason. And you may not understand that reason at the be in the beginning, but the day will come when you will understand it. Until then, don't murmur, don't complain about where God has you, because it vexes him. It, it vexes him. It shows that you're walking in unbelief. Don't tell God about how much faith you got, and you complaining about where he has you. We're talking about a God that set all of this up before any of us were born. 
And so we, you know, we get to be 30, 40, 50 years old and think, uh, I know better than God. You see, when you complain, what you're telling God is, I don't care that you took the time out to map my life out for me before I got here, before I was born. I own it. You, you know what it looks like to God? It looks like a little child that you bring into the store that's falling out all over the place because you're not buying him what he what what he wants. God got a lot of spiritual brats for children. Everybody understand? Falling out, flopping, that's what, that's what you look like to God when you complain and murmur about where he's brought you. A spiritual brat. You see? And so let's not be that way. Let's, let's just fall in line with God's will. Amen. All right. So we'll, we're going to close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and we thank you for everything that you've spoken to us. And God, we pray as we continue to talk about uh, the locations, Lord, that you will help us to understand and to get what it is that you want us to hear, Lord. We pray that you, that we will, that you will help us to take these things into our hearts and, and, and to learn from these things, Lord, that we're going to read concerning your different servants that you relocated and the different ones that you uh, blessed in their locations, God. We thank you so much for... Uh, placing us where you've placed us, Lord, and we pray that you will help us as we uh, continue to live our lives and, and function in, in your will, Lord, and to be a blessing to others as well. We pray, Lord, that you will help us all to find our purpose of why we are here, Lord, and help us to not only do what you've called us to do, Lord, but to do it with joy. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.